Welcome back to Big Data on Bruce. Today with Oscar Boykin from Twitter. Can you introduce yourself and your brew? Uh, yeah, um, I'm Oscar Boykin. I'm on the uh, analytics infrastructure team at Twitter. I work mostly on a project called Scalding and uh, more recently a project called Summingbird. Uh, I've been there for a little over two and a half years and uh, I've got this like Hawaii fetish going on, so not not that exciting uh, a beer exactly, but like it's reminding me of my recent trip to Hawaii, so I got, I got that, and uh, and I've been trying some IPAs lately, and that one looked like a good one. Heard it was good. We're gonna give it a try. Let's start with the Hawaiian one. I'm okay. curious. So, um, you go surfing in Hawaii, or? Uh, no, no. Uh, just uh, I, not this time. I'm not a great surfer, but I, I surfed a couple of times. But I was just there. I've been like. Uh, Right before I left, I do most of my work actually on GitHub. Yeah. And I took a look. GitHub has these like all these kind of borderline ex exploitative uh, stats. You know, it's yeah. like how many consecutive days have you committed code? Yeah. And I was like, right before I left, it was oh, I had you. gotten up to thirty nine. Okay. And I'm like, okay, it's it's thirty nine consecutive we, days of like of like working it's on time this for code. Hawaii. Maybe it's time for Hawaii. Yeah. You, you go yeah. hiking there? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Did, did a lot of hiking. Did a lot of swimming. Some some really nice snorkeling and uh, just nice. hanging out at the beach. You know. Yeah, that's yeah. good. It helps with the code writing. Yeah, actually, I was amazed. Like, so I was amazed how good my mood was when I got yeah. right back because it was just totally relaxed, totally chill. You know, sometimes people um, say that I sound like the dude, uh, <laughs> but I don't really act that much like the dude. Okay. But when I got back for like you know like a good twenty minutes, I was totally like relaxed and yeah. chill. Yeah. Well, cheers. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thanks for having me. Oh, this is good. It's a lager. Yeah, that that resonates well with me. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's a German. Well, I, I selected it just oh. for you. <laughs> so, um, tell me a little bit more about um, your background and uh, what brought you to Twitter. What did you there before? And then let's dive deep into scale folding after. Sure. Scaling. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do both. Good. Um, I uh, so I my background actually was in. Um, uh, so my undergraduate degree is in, in mathematics and physics, mm -hmm. and I got my PhD in physics, but I was always kind of interested in like computation. Right. Um, so at that time, uh, uh, quantum computing was still kind of a big thing, was yeah. like, a, like an exciting kind of new area. So I, I worked in that area for a while, and I was uh, just before Twitter. So after I graduated my PhD from UCLA, I went to University of Florida, mm -hmm. where I was a faculty member there for several years. and. Uh, I had this like very uh, ivory tower notion of like what uh, academia is all about, but really uh, academia <laughs> was very much like a job like anything else. Yeah, and uh, I just kind of started feeling like I was missing a lot of what was going on. I got more and more interested in um, large scale computation. Right. So my research kind of moved over to that more and mm -hmm. more, and it really felt like there's a lot more exciting stuff going on in industry, honestly, yeah. than could be done uh, in academia right now. And I still think it's true. So. Yeah. So anyway, I interviewed a lot of places, and I just uh, the team that I met when I came to Twitter, really, they were just really great. And uh, it seemed like Twitter was, uh, I always loved the product. Um, and they had, like, you know, they were just right there. At that, like, it felt like, to me, like a cusp of, like, really, like, you know, doing some really cool stuff and getting their ducks in a row. Not to, like, bag on, like, how, how, how yeah. rode up those ducks were beforehand. Yeah. The whales in the yeah. water, yeah. The whales were still uh, <laughs> in the water there. And, um, and, but, yeah, it's been really fun to be there while... Uh, you know, we've really built a lot of great things and uh, done a lot of great open source work. Um, and Twitter has become very, very reliable. And yeah, so it's been a great time. Cool. I have this theory. I think that all real data scientists slash really, really, really good engineers that have some mathematical background studied physics. Oh, huh, yeah. I, it, and there's, a, there's a pattern there. We yeah. just had uh, Michael uh, Seller um, from Cementis here. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's a physician, right? Uh, Hans Doctor is a physician, um, so there must be a pattern there. So I think uh, phys so one one difference between physicist and computer scientist when you act, uh, ask them like how they think about problems. I think physicists are very used to thinking about things in terms of vector spaces. Okay. And a lot of huh. uh, approximation algorithms or so forth, I think, really help to think about vector space. Mm -hmm. Whereas a computer scientist will tend to think about hashing right. or this like which are kind of similar to random projections, but um, yeah. I, I, at least, I don't know. So um, Ashish Noel, who's at uh, Stanford, who comes and consults it at uh, Twitter, says, like, hey, you're a physicist. You physicists get these analogies right away. But, like, I have to say it twice. For the computer <laughs> Let me explain it to yeah, computer yeah, scientists. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> so um, what are you working on on Twitter? And then... Uh, what I'm working on now... So... Um, uh, 
So the thing that I worked on for a long time, so you, you mentioned this point of being a data scientist. In fact, you know, it's still technically my title. When I joined Twitter, I worked on the revenue team, and we were really just getting started with uh, prediction of uh, ag clicks. Uh, we run an ad market there, um, not dissimilar to the standard kind of uh, markets that you see, um, and also uh, ad targeting. And But we didn't really have the tooling that we really wanted to use. So Avi Bryant was the one who suggested that we build something on top of uh, cascading. Um, and cascading is a library that we can talk about a little bit more for programming uh, Hadoop. So at the early days, we were basically, I was very involved with like, I'd write a little bit of code and then we'd go analyze the data a lot, we'd use it, and then I'd write a little bit more code and we'd analyze the data a lot more. But as Twitter's grown, there been more and more engineers using it, I, I wound up being the guy more and more who was like developing the framework and so yeah. spending a lot of time on scalding. And so that was something that ate up an increasing amount of my time. Uh, but but lately, I've been interested in trying to do the same thing to make real time calculations really really easy. Okay. So um, so pulling scalding on like an in memory platform. Yeah, uh, in memory storm things like right. this. And so. I, th I think that the the thing that that MapReduce got really right. So a lot of people mean a lot of different things when they say MapReduce. Right. Sometimes they might mean like uh, literally Google's implementation, right. or they might mean the Lisp like pair right. of Lisp functions, right. map and reduce, or whatever. But uh, what I mean, I guess, is just this kind of like abstract model, you know, of like, you know, you have, you know, partitions of data right. uh, that live out there, and that you can take some function that will operate on each of these in parallel, and you promise that this is a parallel operation. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of the map, you know, right. so you, and now you have some data, now it looks like V, of some type right. V. And now we have some way of like, well, usually we want it because we want to do some more parallelism in the end. Yeah. We have a, another key and we're going to now bucket these things up in the right way right. and then finally reduce, right? So we have some other function G on all the, the V's, right? And they, they give us some new value. So this, this model is like amazing because the, the programmer says that at this stage, this is purely parallel, mm -hmm. trivially parallel. Right. right. And after this phase, the only thing that I care about is like the value of this key. And right. then after that, I'm going to do my series operation. Right. And so this is something that you can explain to someone relatively quickly, and they don't have to know anything about hard disks right. or about network right. or about threads or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And like someone on one end of the table who's like a total systems person can walk away and go build this system yep. without any knowledge of algorithms. Right. And someone who knows about algorithms can make like, like yeah. really make effective use of a giant computer. on that platform. That's yeah. the big, big, big. <laughs> contribution of, of MapReduce, I yeah. think. Um, it's pretty obvious, I guess, to people who know MapReduce. So, but I didn't really see this was uh, something very easy to use in real time. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been working on for like the last, you know, um, nine months or so. And then what's real time for you? So, um, so for uh, at Twitter, the canonical example would be tweets. Like, yeah. you know, tweets come in, we want to do some like language processing or uh, we want to uh, estimate which, is there something new, a new event happening that we didn't know about before? Are there new hashtags people were talking about that they weren't before? Or is there a dramatic change in any of these statistics? Mm -hmm. And we want to know that like, you know, on the order of seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you can do it much faster. Uh, there's this trade-off, of course, by how much we cache, how much we kind of like trade network uh, efficiency right. for... Uh, well, like, yeah. like you don't want to send every single message you exactly. have to buffer to get a performance. Yeah, yeah. so the trade-off <laughs> of like kind of buffer size versus like, yeah. like latency. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, so that's kind of... Uh, uh, and we, we've got a, a model that is slightly more restrictive than this, has a few more pieces to it, um, it's a MapReduce like model where you don't just where we think of we can talk about it more later, but which I'm like I'm really happy with that did this a similar kind of thing of saying like there's only a handful of abstractions mm -hmm. and you can understand those abstractions and then we can then optimize the system really really well around those. Before we talk a little bit more about scalding, um, why don't for the benefit of the of the people that seeing this, um, why don't we? Why don't you explain kind of the the layers, right? So there's um, there's hardware, there's sure. Hadoop, there's cascading. What is cascading, right? Yeah. And, and and then how did you guys get to building scalding on top of that? And what are the benefits? And so I I think cascading is a great piece of software. I'll I'll kind of introduce it from we talked. To, I don't know if I should just erase. I'll erase with my hand. <laughs> we'll leave some of these around. But um yeah. So if you're going to build a, a giant a, a cluster to do some computation, mm -hmm. no one would do that anymore, right? They would yeah. go to Amazon or whatever. Yeah. But uh, you would have the um, the machines. They have little keyboards there, you know, because it's 1972, <laughs> and they all um, hey, they all make two, huh? Right. Apple twos. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, they're running some operating system. They have some disks there. Uh, they're running um, Windows, Lin Mac Linux, OS. Windows, whatever <laughs> you like. Yeah. Uh, but now we want to use them all together to, to, to solve one large problem. And so we want to take this picture here that we drew, this abstract picture, and make it concrete. So on each of these machines now is running this software, you know, Hadoop, right? That's the kind of the lingua franca of... Uh, is, it? is there a German uh, equivalent to that? To us? Hadoop? Yeah. To lingua franca? Um, um, I'm not sure. You maybe would say the golden standard or something. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 something yeah. along Definitely those lines. Definitely not lingua franca. No. Yeah, yeah. No, we're not okay. that sophisticated. <laughs> Um, so Hadoop uh, like took this, I guess it was really uh, the Google paper, yeah. and it was a re-implementation of that. It was a good idea, and they yeah. did it in Java. So that's great. Uh, Java is... Like, like Carafella and, and yeah. Cutting took the, basically the paper. And Carafella is a professor at, I forgot, Michigan, maybe? Is he? I didn't know that. Is he? Um, most likely I'm wrong. Oh, Seattle? Washington? That's Washington. Right. I think Washington. he's at Washington. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very cool. Um, so... Hadoop gave us an implementation of this MapReduce model, but it still was really focused. And I mean, I don't really remember the timeline. You may know better. Of uh, so, there's it was focused on single MapReduce pairs. Yeah. And a lot of calculations are interesting. Can be written as a single MapReduce pair. Yeah. If you want to know how many times a word yeah. appeared on a web page, great. But then if you chain them together, it's becoming really messy. Right. If you want to work with graphs, right. if you want to work right. with uh, you know any kind of iterative machine learning, you know, then you're going to have to go with yeah. a, a bit more than one. If you think of uh, MapReduce as a message passing kind of thing, this is like the the the, the shuffle phase is where you do the message passing, right? right? So that's the only time you can do messaging. And so if that's the only time you can do messaging, you can think of the class of algorithms you can do with MapReduce as, with one phase, as the one, the, the kind of the one message pass algorithms. Right. Like, um, so everybody wants to do more than that. And for a long time, people just made their own ways of doing this. So they'd schedule one job, they'd wait for it right. to finish, they'd go to the next. Right. And you manage all the files in between, and it's a big, you know. Right. So what I like to say, uh, you know, it's kind of like you have to pitch a startup, like it's like mm -hmm. Uber for yeah. blah for blah. So, like, <laughs> but, uh, so I don't know if this helps, but cascading is like LLVM for Hadoop, right? Okay. Yeah. So LLVM is like we're, we're going to give an intermediate representation of code that if you want to make a compiler, you can target this intermediate right. representation, and then we can we can compile that down to whatever. various chips, whatever. Right. And like that's the way I like to view uh, mm -hmm. cascading, um, mm -hmm. or at least one layer of cascading. Yeah. And so cascading, if you target it, it has some notions of like mapping functions, grouping, re reductions, right. but they can be chained in a large graph. So you can do this, do this, this job's running over here, it does some grouping, now we consume both of these, and we're building a very large graph, maybe 90 or more MapReduce phases. Right. And cascading a lot, like, manages all that, if it fails, it backs the whole thing out. So it's a right. graph DAG management. Right. It does it very well, it's been used kind for a few years, it's not perfect, but it's, it's very, very good, it's high quality. Yeah, great. Um... Kudos to Chris Wenzel then, yeah. Kudos to Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Always. We, we hope you come one day. You come yeah. come here to drink beer again. <laughs> um, so, and then, <clears throat> what did you guys build on top, and why? Okay. So, why, what do we build on top, and why? So, um, so I've been I've been arguing this the following point uh, like lately. Uh, Paul Phillips, who is one of the guys who uh, worked on the Scala compiler for mm -hmm. a long time had this uh, great slide deck recently. It was really, really great. And he makes this point that people debate all these things about like performance or compatibility of different systems. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like correctness uh, is what matters. Right. The correctness is like if you, if you don't if you have a really fast way to get an, in, an incorrect answer or you're not building really nobody it cares. doesn't matter, right? right? So I believe the interesting thing about functional programming is mm -hmm. that it allows you to scale to very large scales and keep a handle on correctness better than other styles of programming because you have less code. Because you have less state. Okay. So like like you, you like getting rid of so Java said to C programmers, it's a pain in the ass to malloc and free, guess what? Right. We're not even going to put that in the language. You can't even get that wrong. You can get it wrong by hiding yeah. things in a array yeah. list or a map, but, but for the most part, you can't get it wrong. So what a lot of functional programming does is says, okay, dealing with mutation, dealing with state changes is a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to even, like, no more mutation. Okay. Okay, everything's going to be immutable. Okay. 
it forces you to change about how things like how would I even structure an algorithm if I can't do like if variables aren't variable anymore. Right. They're just aliases for other names. Right. But the whole classes of errors get get removed. Uh-huh. Like a, a, a thread synchronization is gone. Like you don't have a problem with that. You can have other kinds of bugs in the same way that you can yeah. put too much stuff uh-huh. in a list. But but more to the point, MapReduce was already functional programming. Uh-huh. So you can write MapReduce yep. in Java, uh-huh. but like it or not, you're doing functional programming. Yeah. So you can find a language like Scala, which makes functional programming very convenient. Uh-huh. You can get a lot of the benefits of like going functional all the way. When we teach people how to use Scalding, they're all the way, they, they get the model, okay, this is functional programming. When you come from Java, I've seen a lot of people, they want to imagine that their map function is really like an, like any other Java program they're used to. Mm-hmm. And you have to remember that, oh, I don't have shared memory on this other place. And right. if I mutate this variable, no one's going to see yeah. it. But in Scala, you don't wouldn't you wouldn't do that anyway. You okay. know, you're just like you Because you don't the, have the variables. It's yeah. already a data flow kind yeah. of model where you kind of just like functionally compose these flows and they look exactly like MapReduce flows. Yeah. So Scalding allowed you to write these jobs that look like their normal operations on collections. Mm-hmm. But they actually run Hadoop. So that was like a really, really big win. Okay. And because Scala allows these inline lambdas, now Java will have that soon. You could write something similar in Java once they get that. But that's usually your map function in Hadoop is like, you know, do map, something. Like Spit turn everything up. to lowercase right. or, you yeah. know, <laughs> parse all these strings to yeah. integers. But why should I have to make a whole giant class to do that very trivial oh, yeah, thing? Yeah. So what, what, what that would look like in Scalding is you do dot map. And you'd have a string, str, and you'd have this bad arrow, and you'd say string dot, you know, to int. Right. And that's your whole map class. Boom. You know, yeah. and behind the scenes, it's going to, you know, it goes into Hadoop, it runs. But this is JVM code. It gets statically compiled. The Scala uh-huh. compiler is going to do that. And it's very fast. So yeah. that's been a big win. So it seems like you're a big fan in Scala. Actually... I'm a bigger fan of functional programming. Okay. I mean, Scala has plenty of words, but yeah, I like, I like functional programming. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what, what's your, beyond all this, sounds like Scala is your language of choice now? Or like- well, Scala is the language that we, that, so Twitter is all in the JVM for the most part. I would say 80% of the JVM. We mm-hmm. use Java, Scala, a uh, little bit of Ruby still. So Scala is my language of choice. Yeah, I would. I would and if you go home and have a good time, if it be on the evening, what, what language do you use? I would, uh, then I would prefer to work with Haskell. Haskell? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we will do a quick break and then I will learn more about Haskell, I think. I want to know more about that. Okay.